Messenger called our next speaker the most dangerous man in America who had to be stopped. Daniel Ellsberg photocopied 7,000 pages of top secret documents detailing three decades of U.S. involvement in Vietnam, also known as the Pentagon Papers. He first gave these documents to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and in 1971, he released them to the New York Times, the Washington Post, and 17 other newspapers. The release of these documents, which detailed the United States' political and military involvement in Vietnam, from 45 to 67, set in motion a chain of events that led to convictions of several White House aides and figured in the impeachment proceedings against President Nixon and ultimately an end to the Vietnam War. I often wonder how the media would deal with those documents today. His trial on 12 felony counts posing a possible sentence of 115 years was dismissed in 1973 on grounds of governmental misconduct. Daniel Ellsberg gives a riveting account of these world-changing events in the excellent and must-see documentary, The Most Dangerous Man in America. Highly, highly recommended. Less well-known his, is his work for the Rand Corporation and as a consultant to the Defense Department and the White House specializing in problems of the command and control of nuclear weapons, nuclear war plans, and crisis decision making. Since the end of the Vietnam War, Daniel Ellsberg has been a lecturer, writer, and activist of the nuclear era, wrongful US interventions, and the urgent need for patriotic whistleblowing. Of the Right Livelihood Award, known as the Alternative Nobel Peace Prize in Stockholm, Sweden. He's the author of three books, including Secrets, a Memoir of Vietnam and the Pentagon Papers. He's working on an account of his experience in the world of nuclear weapons. Whenever we call him to come on the radio show, he always does. He's got an amazing energy. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Daniel. Hear me all right? Yeah. You're back over there. Well, imagine what it means to me to be in a room actually where I have many heroes, but in particular my two heroes from Congress were here. Barbara Lee had to leave. <coughs> Sorry, Sam. Some water. <coughs> I wish I could say she was my congressperson. Uh, I live in. Uh, Kensington, but as a matter of fact, I do say she is my kindest person. Uh, wherever I was living in this country, Barbara Lee would be my representative, is my representative. And to be preceded here, imagine what it means to me to be preceded by the man that I supported twice for president. Uh, everything he said uh, spoke for me uh, and still does. And he, uh, his program was exactly right, uh, should have been instituted. So I've lost one of my heroes from Congress, but uh, he obviously still had it here, which is very important. When I came tonight, uh, Jackie, I spoke to my friend Jackie and said, you know, I know this is a celebration, 30 years of Western States and uh, fundraiser, and it's a celebration, but I'm not in a really celebratory mood as I look at the world very much. <clears throat> and she pointed out, excuse me, <clears throat> she pointed out, well, I said, uh, what are we celebrating tonight? She <laughs> said, we're still here. <laughs> that could have been taken as Western States is still here. Uh, I don't know what to deal, how to deal with this half-life uh, estimate that they're making here. Uh, John Kerry, after all, is telling us we're going to need Western states working for hundreds of years, for centuries, right? Uh, if uh, he has anything to say about uh, <clears throat> the need for reducing nuclear weapons. 
But um, she meant more than that, of course. She said, we're still here, we're alive. And that is, was not to be taken for granted in many of the years of my life, most of the years of my life. There's several ways I've been, I've been thinking about that this evening. I'm old enough to remember a phrase uh, that uh, perhaps a few of you do remember when I was a kid. The wisecrack was, great day for the race, isn't it? What race? The human race. Great. We said race thing, not species. The race got kind of downloaded. Well, we could go on the assumption uh, that so many people do with respect to nuclear war, that after all it has been 60 years, the world was loaded with nuclear weapons, uh, still loaded with nuclear weapons, but less, less by as much as 70 or 80 percent. And uh, uh, that shows that there's really no problem, and that's the way people are acting, and have been acting for some time now. Now, each of us here, it occurred to me tonight, has not died yet. Right? Uh, and we could take a lot of comfort from that uh, about living forever, as uh, John Kerry says, uh, you know, celebrating the end of nuclear weapons hundreds of years from now. We know that isn't going to happen for individuals. When Dennis talked about the splitting of the, uh, of <clears throat> the atom with uranium at that point, uh, what really happened then was, in the eyes of some of the first people to look at that, Leo Zillard and others, was that suddenly society and civilization and our species and many other species were as mortal as individuals and measured almost on the same time scale. The notion that we're still here is indeed something we celebrated. As I say, it wasn't fated to happen uh, at all during this period, and I happen to have lived closer to that uh, contingency, that concern, than uh, some other people, because I was involved in nuclear war planning, of all things, uh, for some years in the early 60s, just a long time ago, half a century ago. At that point, the United States had spent its enormous amount of money, perhaps a trillion dollars by that time, in current, current money. And its best scientific minds in physics and chemistry and others, the uh, greatest collection of Nobel Peace, well, not Peace Prize winners, Nobel or Physics Prize winners and chemistry winners and whatnot. The best engineers, the most highly advanced engineering uh, of the time went in, first of all, to the B-29 that dropped the bomb on. Hiroshima, that was the most advanced piece of technology the human species had ever evolved, the most complicated, the most, uh, the most uh, uh, capable in many respects, <clears throat> and was uh, used, of course, to, as a vehicle for the atom bomb, which itself, think of it, was the highest expression of science, of intellect, I'm not talking wisdom, but intellect, cognitive ability, and technology that, again, the species had ever seen and had been far, of course, uh, outstripped in many respects. And the ICBM came along and the expression, well, it's not rocket science, you know, and so forth, entered our, our consciousness as determining the, the, the extreme point of uh, what humans were capable of doing technologically and so forth and what it was being turned to. Now, in that period, then, I became aware of one thing uh, and, and was remained ignorant for another 20 years of the real significance of what I was looking at. I drafted a question actually for President Kennedy to ask to the Joint Chiefs of Staff what would be the consequences in terms of life and death, how many deaths would be involved if our current then war plans, 1961, were executed as planned. And this was, by the way, uh, under I, just after Eisenhower's term, in which those uh, war plans were definitely, explicitly intended to be used under a variety of circumstances, not involving a, an attack on the United States by nuclear weapons. For example, uh, Berlin, the divided Berlin, uh, if it were walked into, or more seriously, if West Germany uh, in some way was invaded <coughs> by Russians. But 
more than that, fighting Russians anywhere in the world. I won't go into the implausibility of this or how it came about. But under Eisenhower, fighting Russians under any circumstances, anywhere in the world, Korea, Yugoslavia, Iran, wherever it might be, would call for the execution of these plans. So I asked them what the consequences would be if uh, they carried out the plans, and they were as, as planned. They weren't interfered with by some terrible screw-up or a preemption by the Russians and so forth. And it turned out, I'm going to go over this very quickly now, it turned out that they had an answer to that. And the answer came back and I held it in my hands in the White House uh, since I'd asked the question. I was shown a, piece, shown a piece of paper that was I was not normally supposed to see. It was marked at the top, top secret, sensitive, joint chiefs of staff, and then for the eyes of the end president only. Eyes only for the president. So why was I seeing it? Well, I had written the, the question, so they showed me the answer. I'll summarize the answer because it's late here and I don't want to go through the whole thing. 600 million people would be killed if we carried out our plans. Now, a few million of those might be Soviets, would be Soviet soldiers and a few more million would be Chinese soldiers. It was very clear, by the way, that 600 million was, was a definite underestimate. It didn't include fire, believe it or not, blast, radiation, prompt radiation, but not fire, which is the main effect of thermonuclear weapons. That would at least double the consequences. So they were really telling us, the president, that if he pushed the button uh, as was, he was supposed to do under a variety of circumstances, he would doom to death immediately 1.2 or maybe billion people out of a population that was between 3 and 4 billion. Or as Edward Teller said, this, this sounds like a macabre joke, but I've really heard him say it, only one quarter of the Earth's population. This was uh, the glass three quarters full. So this was not in itself a doomsday machine because the United States would be almost free probably of the immediate consequences of this. We would, our, our supremacy at that time was such that in a first strike, which we were talking about, uh, they would probably not get any missiles, warheads, on the United States or possibly a few from submarines that happened to be at sea. <clears throat> but Europe would be gone. When I say 600 million or 1.2 billion, keep in mind what we're talking about that. That is almost entirely civilians. And it's mostly our allies and neutrals. Europe would be gone from the fallout of our own warheads on Russia and the East Spot. And what is the East Spot? The captive nations in those days, you know, uh, occupied by the Russians, wiped out essentially but also neighboring countries there, like Afghanistan, interestingly enough, Finland, Austria, parts of, large parts of India, and so forth. Now, obviously, I could stop right there and just let us meditate and think about what it meant for this to be, have been produced. It was not, if that had been discovered as a plan by Nazi Germany, it would have seen natural use of their, their use of scientific capability. It would have seen the essence of Nazism, would it not? It would hardly have surprised us, so shocking though it would be. Actually, it wasn't though. It was produced by the United States of America, by Americans. And if you think it was people who were humanly, genetically, uh, evolutionarily entirely different from us, uh, that would be wrong, actually. Uh, such people do exist who are really unusual outliers in the human community, like Hitler, or Stalin, or Mao, or Pol Pot. But these plans, most of, the, most of the danger in the world has not been created by such people, and this plan in particular was not created. It was created by the people we elected, and uh, a few of them, and then by enormous numbers of people who were, well, like me. I was, uh, I was in this, in this uh, participation shocked as I was by this. I thought it was the most evil plan I had ever, I had never imagined such an evil plan should exist. But it did exist and it described what we could do. But I want to move very quickly to something I didn't know then in 1961. 
it was 20 years long, uh, later, basically 1982, 1983, which is uh, 30 years, what is it? Almost 30 years ago, that a number of scientists discovered that the effects that they had ignored in that plan, which included fire, although they knew fire was a major fact, included smoke. Where there's fire, there's smoke. And when you burn down every city of the Soviet Union and China, which we propose to do, aside from the Russian retaliation against cities in Europe, the smoke from that, those fires would go far, would be lofted by the explosions far above the stratosphere. And in the early 80s, it was thought, the furthest they could calculate it was that it would last at least a year, destroying all crops, possibly uh, if it came in the spring or summer, reducing temperatures down where the rivers froze, the reservoirs froze, harvests all failed, and so forth, what they called nuclear winter. Now, the Pentagon and others went into action very quickly there with the same, what someone has called merchants of doubt, that operated on the relation between tobacco and cancer, or climate change more recently. Doubt, indications, and saying this was really hyped, we couldn't really know, it was too uncertain. And really, the impression grew, and I would guess even in this very well-informed audience, there are many people here who have absorbed the teaching, the learning, that nuclear winter was debunked and turned out to be like Y2K or something, an overhyped uh, sort of problem. And that really has persisted very much, in particular through the last, through the last century. I would suspect that relatively few, even in this audience, are aware that in the last seven or eight years, the calculations have been redone now by some of the original people and others whom I've talked to, like Alan Robach and Brian Toon, with much more advanced computer models that were not possible in the early 80s. And these have made it possible now to uh, answer all the criticisms that were made by, very, by the doubters earlier as to what the effects of carrying out these, these attacks that were planned would be, and have found not only that they confirmed the original result, but that it's much, much worse than they realized in two respects. The earlier computer power was simply not enough to carry the calculations beyond a year for the world. Now they've done it much longer periods and discovered that the smoke will actually persist, I didn't mention earlier, with the effect of greatly reducing the sunlight reaching the Earth for 10 years or more, meaning no harvests for 10 years in the world. That's the worst effect, but a very, a very likely one. There can be somewhat lesser effects. Uh, a more recent calculation which, which puts this thing into perspective is that a war between India and Pakistan using simply 50 Hiroshima-type weapons, the, the, uh, or Nagasaki weapons, the kind they have, each, or 100 altogether, would have the effect of lowering sunlight reaching the Earth for years by nearly 7%, not nearly as much as a war between the US and Russia. And the effect of that on harvests, on shortening growing seasons, on killing harvests, on producing freezing nights which kill a particular harvest, even if the next night is not freezing, the effect of that would be to kill one billion people out of a much larger population now, uh, approaching seven billion. But a billion of the people who are now most marginally challenged in the way of nutrition would be the ones to go in the world. How is it acceptable that India and Pakistan, with their recurrent crises and their ongoing war over Kashmir, and now in other respects as well, can be allowed to develop and test weapons which, if used, <laughs> would kill a billion people outside their area. Should that be acceptable? Is that part of their sovereignty? Can a world order really accept that? 
Well, let's not, I think that's a very concrete question. That's, that's definitely a war zone, uh, just like Pakistan, Afghanistan now, you might say. Now we come back to the United States. The fact was that in 1961, Americans had produced a doomsday machine that would have killed all vertebrate life on Earth, all animals that rely on vegetation for living. Most species, in other words. Robach said to me the other day that extinction, we're so adaptable as humans, that extinction is perhaps not, is probably not the literal result of all this. He said there will be some humans on islands somewhere in the southern hemisphere, maybe fishing, not a joke, there will be fishing, not relying on vegetation. There will be some humans. Maybe there will be uh, half a million, maybe there will be a million, maybe there will be 50 million. It's a large number. Stone Age, back to the Stone Age, essentially. But society, gone. Now that was true in 61, actually it was true earlier than that, probably in about 58, 59. H-bombs, which really do the job here, came in into deployment around 56. But by 61 we had that, or 62, so there we have, what, 50 years, half a century ago. <coughs> What was the response to these findings, which, as I say, have been confirmed now a decade ago? The same as when they were first put out 30 years ago by Carl Sagan and Toon and Turco and the others, and Gorbachev, by the way. Nothing. No effect on the plans. Still targeting in the vicinity of cities and in cities to the effect that we will wipe ourselves out, not immediately, but over a matter of months or a year or two by starvation from our own weapons. After the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Soviets concluded that they needed, uh, they had been outgunned in this, they needed what the U.S. had. That was a mistake, a terrible mistake. It bankrupted them, basically. But more seriously, they, they didn't need that. But what they did was to imitate the U.S. Uh, building up in about 64, uh, almost exactly in, in, in characteristics of weapons and types of weapons. There are now two doomsday machines in the world on alert, each subject to warning and launch on warning with, full, uh, with possibly a false alarm or in fear that the other is about to, is about to strike and should be struck first. <coughs> two doomsday machines, in other words, far more than twice as dangerous as having one. The other countries don't have uh, what it takes to kill all life on Earth. They will if they resume testing very quickly. The French don't have essentially MERV. And they need a lot of testing for multiple independent reentry vehicles. They would have a doomsday machine very quickly if testing resumed. Uh, many other countries would, would do the same if they could. So we'd have a number of them in the world. It seems to go without saying don't, I can be, there should not exist a doomsday machine in the world. Right. And very modest, the very modest, the very modest goal of making it impossible, and it is possible to do, you can say what technical steps need to be done, what operations need to be done, to make it impossible to destroy life on Earth can be spelled out fairly easily and would seem to recommend themselves quite strongly. <laughs> ironic there, but uh, what, what is there to say? Without nuclear winter, we already had a plan that was devilishly insane, reckless, mad, uh, unforgivable inexcusable. With the nuclear winter, which we've known about for 30 years, or if you want to be really fine on it, a good 10 years uh, since, uh, that's perfectly obvious. What does that mean to get down to? There's a rumor just now that uh, Obama, having labored for five years at a new nu uh, nuclear posture review, well, he had one in 2010, but for the implementation it's worked for the last three years of this nuclear posture review, a big change. He's thinking, uh, this is a rumor, no, no, it just came out the other day, that he's thinking of cutting 
our forces scheduled for 2017, as of now, by one-third. Very good. From 1750 or 1550 missiles, 1550, down to a thousand. Nice round number of a thousand. There's no way of throwing 1550 warheads, which by the way are the alert warheads now. We have 5,000 operational and 5,000 more on the shelf awaiting this management, 10,000. They have 10,000 too. But 5,000 is a good figure for each one, except that we're getting down to, uh, to something like 1,500 on alert, hair trigger, ready to go. The difference between 1,500 and 15,000, let's say, will not be just perceptible by any bar probe from some other planet later. It's, it's, it's no difference. The effect is the same. We're gone. Everybody's gone. Getting down from 1,500 to 1,000 is meaningless, <clears throat> totally meaningless. By the way, Obama's first move was to get down from 1,750 to 1,550. <laughs> I mean, that's what we're talking about. In other words, the notion uh, that oh, President Obama, our current president, for whom I voted twice, by the way, and I'm not unhappy about that, considering the alternative. Um, <laughs> Nevertheless, it's doing about what I expected in the way of abolishing nuclear weapons, as he said, approaching a world free of nuclear weapons. It is as reliable as his promise on his first day in office to close Guantanamo. It's worthless. Uh, worthless. And it, it's absolutely meaningless, and nothing has been coming out on that at all. Uh, Thirty years ago, Herb York, the first director of Livermore Lab, and some of you have no Livermore Lab, sat and gotten arrested in the work. He was the first director of um, devoted especially to production of the H-bomb. He gave a talk at Livermore Lab. Uh, I got to know him later in life. A very interesting guy, actually. And uh, very, very insightful in many ways. But he gave this talk at Livermore, which is quite striking. Uh, so I remembered it, and it was very hard for me to track it down again. 1990, and he said he wanted to talk about the notion of minimum, de minimum deterrence. He accepted the notion that some deterrence was essential, at any rate, was certainly realistic, was going to go on for a long time. The question was, how much do you need? And he wanted to answer Michael May, who again is not the worst guy at Livermore, that's not the worst. he was talking about 5,000 weapons, and he wanted to question that as a, something to get down to. That was 30 years ago. That's what we're down to now, the way of Operation Weapons. So he quoted McGeorge Bundy that he said on retirement from, uh, from the government, mm -hmm. as having said that in the real world of political leaders where people like my colleagues at Rand and in the Pentagon were talking about assuring at least World War II type casualties on, on uh, Russia at the very minimum, uh, because they had, they had understood that they got through that very well and that wouldn't slow them down at all. And their 20 million killed had to be greater than that. Or that it would be very good that we should spend any number of billions of dollars getting our casualties out of the war from 200 billion, 250 billion, million, like that. And McGeorge Bundy was saying this is totally unrealistic. This is not the way politicians really think about the world. And don't take too much reassurance from this from <clears throat> from Bundy, that's another story, but he did say this. He said, in the real world of political leaders, as, as, her, as your court said, any policy which in advance was known to bring a single hydrogen weapon on a city of one's own country would be regarded in advance as a catastrophic blunder. Ten weapons on one's own country would be a disaster beyond history. And then he ended by saying, a hundred is unthinkable. Now, we had at that time about 30,000 uh, weapons. So, uh, York asked the question, he said, I'll approach it two ways. How can we arrive at a number, if we do accept the notion of deterrence, at least in a transitional period toward abolition for some period, what is a, is a reasonable number to deal with, having facing Michael May's estimate of 5,000? 
And he said, first, we start with the notion of what it takes to deter. This was in 1990. In 1991, we, we attacked, uh, we went into the Gulf War after Kuwait. How many weapons, were, uh, he didn't ask this because it was a year earlier, how many weapons would Saddam Hussein have had to have to deter the mighty uh, United States of America from the Gulf War at that point? Would it be 5,000 or 1,000 or like one? Uh, North Korea has like 10. Now, we don't know if they're actually weaponized, but they have enough material for 10. The talk of attacking North Korea, which existed under Clinton in 1994, went away, even under George Bush, with those weapons. So, uh, so they do have some effect for, uh, for some people in that order. So he says something between, uh, looking at it from that point of view, somewhere in the range of uh, to deter one, 10, or 100, he says. But now let's look at it from another point of view, which I've never heard anybody raise before. What's the largest number you would uh, want any one political leader to have in the way of destructive power at his own control? Uh, is there some limit to that? Can there be too much for, a, uh, for any leader, even an American leader, somebody said? Well, supposing you take the ability to create destruction on the level of World War II in a day, or two days, I mean, like 60 million people. He said, that would be about 100 weapons. He said, maybe a little more, maybe less, quite possibly less. But in his expert opinion, you have 100 weapons. Remember, as I said, we had about 30,000 of them. Or somewhat less, 5,000 now. So the sentence that he came to was, from both points of view, he says, uh, I don't know exactly the point is that you need, I know it's not in the neighborhood of 1,000, he said 30 years ago. It's not 5,000. Uh, it may in truth be less than 100, but he said from this uh, point of view of the total destruction, he says, what you can really justify is something between from 1 to 10 to 100 and closer to 1 than 100. That's almost certainly true. That means that the numbers that are batted around by this administration and every one before it are wildly out of the world of reality. And this, oddly, this was in 1990, he doesn't make any mention of Nuclear winter, I suspect he'd been influenced by his Livermore colleagues that uh, nuclear winter doesn't really exist. I'm sure that if he were doing it now, he'd have to recognize even 100 thermonuclear winter weapons, which Pakistan and India don't have, can kill everybody. Okay, well I've used up, uh, that I think shows us in a way what our task is here and what kind of critique we should bring to bear Congress should be doing what it has never done, and that is have classified hearings, but open hearings, leading toward open hearing of the exact environmental impact, as they say, of any of the multitudes of options that have been come about since then. That has never been done. It could not, of course, I think nuclear glasnost of that kind, which I'd hoped for from Gorbachev, uh, and we, we lost him before he got, just before I think we got to that point, uh, could, I think, wake us up, if anything can, if anything can, from this nightmare of, uh, of uh, relying on threats and capabilities for world destruction. Will we make any of these changes? Will we get down to five or ten nuclear weapons in a matter of a few years. <clears throat> the kinds of human and societal uh, characteristics that Dennis was talking about make that very unlikely. But not impossible. Actually, nothing human, societal is impossible. I've suggested an individual death within 150 years or something is, is pretty certain. Nothing else is certain like that. Involving, uh, involving humans. I would say that it has been 
it is a miracle that we are here from the perspective of 1961, 1971, 81. It's a miracle that we are here today with the, the doomsday machines that I've described, which are currently still in operation, ready to go alert against what? Against a Russia that is, uh, wants to be our ally, essentially, uh, but can be triggered at any time by accident or anything else, still exists. We are on the Titanic, traveling very fast at night in iceberg waters, and we can see icebergs ahead. Not only the nuclear, we see the climate, we see toxics, we see depletion, we see icebergs ahead, but one of those, and I'm so glad that Dennis did mention in addition, as I knew he would, uh, is one of the few who talks not only of climate, in catastrophic terms, but also the continuing nuclear catastrophe. And of course, the very existence of this stuff is a moral catastrophe every minute of the day, every example. A judgment on our species, a judgment on, uh, on civilization, on science, on everything else. The mere existence of these, these capabilities and these thoughts, even if they had just been planned and not, not uh, incorporated in actual possibilities. The Titanic didn't have to go down. There were many ships in the water in the same area that night. None of them hit icebergs. They stopped dead in the water, knowing there were icebergs ahead, till it was daylight. They reversed course in some cases. They went by a southern route, each of which, by the way, was proposed early before it was too late on the Titanic. But the, the owner of the, of the line wanted to set a speed record, had to go through that particular rate, had to go at that high speed, had to go at night, couldn't stop. If he was going to spend on the maiden voyage, a speed record, that just happens to kinds of human, was he, you know, were those evil incentives? Well, no, but the risks were clear. And he was obeyed by the ship's officers who knew what the risks were. I repeat, we are on the Titanic right now. Is it too late to change course in time? Obviously, as humans, as Dennis has pointed out, we have this amazing human species capability of learning, communicating, loving, caring, inventing, imagining, changing in a way that no other species can do. It has two sides. It's given us the doomsday machine, but it has also given us the capability of change. But that change is essential unless the, uh, the machine is to be, was it Tangei or the artist who created a self-destructive machine, I think, as a piece of art at one point. Is that where we are? The odds are, yes, that we can't change in time for this. That's where the odds are. But no one can prove that it's impossible to do, make these changes. We can't know that it's impossible. Miracles have happened. The fact of 60 years without those weapons going off is a miracle. So it shows miracles have happened. But we've seen others that, uh, uh, by the way, I would not have predicted this particular miracle. I would not have expected that I'd be here alive uh, without a nuclear weapon from the perspective of the Cuban Missile Crisis in 62. But beyond that, the change in the USSR, the change in South Africa, the change in Spain and Portugal, even the changes in Latin America today, but especially the ones I just mentioned, predicted by no one, they looked impossible, if anything was. But nothing is, quite. It was unlikely, but they did happen. The people here, I know many of you, have been working for a long time, as I have been, as if it were not too late as if it were possible to change, and no one can show that we were wrong to the ends of our life. And after that, uh, there's, it will never be known that it was. It, looking back, if there is a looking back, some people can say it was too late. Uh, they didn't have a chance. But, and certainly there's a lot of evidence of that right now. But definitely we are not entitled even to believe that with high confidence and say that's why I'm giving up. And that's why none of you here are doing it. That's why you're here tonight. And so what it comes down to is, um, as long as there are people 
who are trying to dismantle the doomsday machine and to dismantle the attitudes that led to it and the priorities and the values that made it look legitimate or unjustifiable or justifiable, which if you think about, you know, that's quite a task. If you can make that look justifiable, you can, you have a great career you know, in, uh, in the Pentagon and uh, advertising and everywhere else. But we've, that's what has to be changed. Dennis has laid out the way he and Barbara Lee showed uh, that even in Congress, one can't speak for this and can't move in that direction. There's so many other heroes here tonight who have done of mine, like Father Louis Vitale, who led me onto the test site for the first time back 30 years ago. And uh, next term, Claire Greensfield, who's been at this forever. Joanna Macy, I could go through the whole audience, the ones I know. Every one of them has earned my gratitude, my admiration, my respect, and is the basis for my hope. Thank you.